Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, October 19th. And tonight, we're talking about gas prices. We're calling it a ready and release plan. President Biden is releasing oil from the nation's strategic reserves in hopes of easing gas prices. We'll have more on the plan and analysis of whether it'll work. Former President Trump answered questions under oath today in a defamation case. The lawsuit against him could move forward after years in limbo. Our legal analyst, Danny Savalos, breaks it down. Vladimir Putin declares martial law in occupied regions of Ukraine, but a Russian general made a rare admission about the state of this war. A report from Moscow is coming up. Also, the Los Angeles City Council is deep in a scandal over racist remarks. Its former president resigned, and more members are under fire. We'll explain. Plus... And do we think back to COVID? that we will ever come up with a vaccine that eliminates it entirely. CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin joins us to preview his new series here on NBC News Now. It debuts tonight with an extended interview with the CEO of Pfizer. Let's begin tonight with gas prices. The U.S. government has tens of millions of barrels of oil stockpiled largely along the Gulf Coast. Today, President Biden announced plans to ease gas prices using some of that supply. He authorized the sale of 15 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The president added that he plans to restock the nation's backup oil supply. Without the steps we've taken over the past several months, to ramp up production and lower prices and get relief to consumers, gas prices would be higher than they are today. And we'll keep doing everything we can to keep it going, to ensure that our energy independence and security is available, and to lower gas prices here at home, and to give folks a little bit of breathing room. We just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America, for God's sake. The Biden administration is making America's largest investment in green energy in the nation's history. Still, the Secretary of Energy touted the country's record fuel production. On average, we have seen the price continue to drop another five cents over this past week. We'll continue, I think, because the president has announced a, uh, an additional release. And he's also encouraging increased production by the oil and gas industry so that we can make up for the barrels that have been taken off the market as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's been two weeks since OPEC announced it would cut oil production by two million barrels a day. That and the Russian invasion of Ukraine are pushing fuel prices higher. Inflation is on just about every American's mind these days. So how will the potential for even higher gas prices impact us? NBC senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell starts us off tonight. Kelly, good evening. Good evening, Joshua. President Biden knows there's one number that many Americans know by heart, and that is the price at the pump. Gas prices have such a direct impact on Americans' budgets and how they feel about the economy. So addressing gas prices is something his White House has tried to make a priority. There was a time a little earlier in the year when gas prices soared dramatically and then began to go down over a period of time. And there's been a tick up again. President Biden blames some outside forces, things like other countries, like the OPEC group that have said they are going to uh, reduce their capacity, which would likely increase prices. And so what can President Biden do? His options are limited. He is using one of the tools in that limited toolkit, and that is releasing more from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. It is the stockpile the U.S. keeps for emergencies. And Republicans are critical, saying that this is a political use of that reserve and not one meant for real emergencies, like when there's a supply disruption from a natural disaster or a wartime. Well, President Biden says the war in Ukraine has been a big factor in prices going up and instability in the global market. So he's releasing 15 million barrels 
from now through the end of the year, and that's a part of what was an overall rollout of 180 million barrels. Uh, that is not going to make a huge difference in and of itself, but is described by many experts as one of the signals that the Biden White House can use to try to uh, suggest that they are taking action, taking steps that can reduce prices. The president also announced plans to replenish that stockpile at a time when prices for oil by the gallon would come down. They're currently around $85 a gallon. When that price Price comes back to $70, and we don't know when that will be. We'd need a crystal ball for that. He would use U.S. taxpayer money to replenish it. And then he says American taxpayers would see a profit from doing that. And so he's got a plan, he says, to replenish the stockpile for those concerned about depleting it and a plan at the moment to try to reduce prices people are feeling right now. The president was asked, is this about the midterm elections? Is this political? He denied that. He said he's been working on this for many months. It's not about the election just a couple of weeks away. It is about inflation as one of the biggest economic priorities for the Biden administration. They claim that is a global problem, and you do see inflation around the world, in some countries higher than it is here in the U.S., and just limited options for what President Biden can do. So he is saying that by taking this step, he hopes to ease some of the pain at the pump. And there are, of course, political realities, a lot of criticism about this, but also a chance to try to say he is taking action. Joshua? All right, thank you, Kelly. That's NBC's Kelly O'Donnell starting us off from the White House. Let's bring in Denton Cinquegrana. He is the chief oil analyst at the Oil Price Information Service. Mr. Cinquegrana, welcome. Good to have you with us. Hey, Joshua. How are you today? Good. Can we just start with a basic definition? What is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and how much petroleum is reserved there? Sure. Well, it's obviously a reserve, so it's kind of like your rainy day fund. It's what you have in case of an emergency. It's the break class in case of emergency. Uh, it holds crude oil, a variety of uh, types of crude oil. You have your light sweet crude oil in there. You have some heavy sour crude oil in there. It's located mostly on the Gulf Coast, the, the, the caverns where, they're, where, the, where the barrels are stored in Texas and Louisiana. Uh, total capacity is probably about 720, 725 million barrels. And when you say light, sweet, and heavy, sour, what are these different flavors of oil used for? Sure. Well, interestingly enough, the way they found out if a crude oil was lightened, and this is, you know, going back 100 years ago when they were first, when some of these fields were first discovered, how do we know it's light, sweet? They would taste it. <laughs> if it was heavy and sour, they would taste it. So, uh, but, you know, using that designation, uh, refineries that, run light and sweet crude is very e much easier to run. I wouldn't say it's very easy to run, but it's easier to run. You don't need the most sophisticated refinery to run a light, sweet crude oil, uh, a heavy, sour crude oil. You might need a little bit more of a sophisticated refinery, um, you know, costs a little bit more money to invest in the equipment required at a refinery to run a heavy, sour crude. What do you make of the president's announcement in terms of releasing more petroleum from there? What impact might that have on the various energy costs that end up being passed down to us? Sure. Well, the last 15 million barrels that was announced, this was a part of the original 180 million barrels that was announced, uh, I believe it was March 31st when, when it was first announced that we're just, it was supposed to be over six months. It's actually kind of trickled into December to the end of the year. Uh, the president did say he's prepared to release more if necessary come, uh, come, the, come early next year and in the wintertime if necessary. I think we're also in a time of year where gasoline prices should be dropping. And I know we got close to $4 a gallon uh, recently, and this is, of course, nationally. Uh, California's different prices are coming down there for certain. Uh, but I do think that $4 level that we got close to a couple weeks ago don't think we're going to get there in the near term here, at least between now and maybe, say, the, the end of the month or maybe even the first week or two into November. Uh, usually it's pretty easy to predict what gasoline prices are going to do with a bit of certainty over, say, a you know 90 day to 180 day period. Uh, 2022 has just been a, you know, throw, throw, throw a dart at the dartboard because it's gotten very, very difficult to go much more than a week or two out. Uh, we are we have to remember we still are in the middle of hurricane season and. You know, 
we've been relatively fortunate. Oh, of course, I you know we get an argument from the from the people who live in Southwest Florida. But as far as refining capacity and the oil industry is concerned, it's been a, a relatively light tropical season. So how much does this release actually affect what we pay? Considering there have been a bunch of other factors, including OPEC Plus deciding to cut production by 2 million barrels a day, the ongoing war in Ukraine, which the administration has blamed for a lot of what we've seen this year anyway, with oil prices. I mean, how much does this release actually help in terms of the price of the pump compared to everything else that's bearing on oil prices? Well, I think there was a little bit of confusion yesterday on, on Tuesday during during market market hours. You saw crude oil prices drop significantly because the market read this as when it first started leaking out as a new release. Um, and then obviously today it came out that no, this is part of that ongoing release and prices shot back up. So we're kind of right back where we started from on, on Monday. Uh, big loss on Tuesday, recovery on Wednesday. But we did see U.S. inventories drop last week, according to the Energy Information Administration. It was a relatively small drop. But again, I don't think this in the grand scheme of things will have much influence one way or the other, this 15 million barrel release. And it's going to take place over the course of December. And we'll see who are the, who are the winning bidders of these SBR barrels. Uh, some of it might go into commercial inventories. Some of it might be exported to uh, maybe to Europe and other places that are short crude oil right now. So when these barrels are released, they're bid on, and then companies bid on the barrels, then use them for whatever they're going to use them for. Is that it? Yeah, and then the Department of Energy, you know, kind of kind of awards, uh, you know, one a company X. 1 million barrels, company Y, you know, maybe 2.5 million barrels and down the line. I can't let you go without asking you about profits. President Biden was among those who has called out the oil industry for, at least in his view, making excessive profits at a time when the American people need some relief. California's Governor Gavin Newsom has made a similar claim and suggested that California's legislature come back into a special session to consider doing something about oil industry profits. Energy is not a charity. This is a business, and it has been a, sure. an uber-high profit business. It is a cartel around the world. How much of this is just oil companies getting in while the getting's good, knowing that their product is a non-renewable resource and going for all the profits they can get while they still can, as opposed to just ordinary market forces? How much of this is just avarice and greed in the prices that we're paying? It's really hard to say because, yes, uber high profits right now. There's also been periods of uber low profits. Uh, just think back to 2020. And I think a lot of where we are right now stems from 2020 when companies were not making money, were actually losing money producing oil, losing money producing gasoline and diesel. So you had no capital to invest in future projects, which is where we are now. Uh, I think there's also an element of get it while you can, because right now, some of these companies are being told, we don't want you around in 20 years. So if I'm, a, if I'm an executive at one of these companies, how do I plan for that? Like, okay, you want, you want me out of business in, in 20 years from now? Well, might as well make now return money and capital to my shareholders and ride off into the sunset. That might be something interesting to talk about another day in terms of the transition that the energy industry is making, knowing that they sell a non-renewable resource and knowing that things like electric cars and different kinds of hybrids are sort of the wave of the future. But for now, Denson Cinquagrana of the Oil Price Information Service, appreciate you talking this through with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joshua. So we know inflation is a huge issue for voters this November. All the latest polling reflects that. But what else do voters care about most? The issues that are big enough to put a sign on your lawn for? NBC's Harry Smith found out by giving people signs and markers. Here's his report from Pennsylvania for our special series, The Power of the Vote. The city of York, Pennsylvania is home to a key moment in American history. Here, the Articles of Confederation were adopted, one of the first legal documents to include the words United States of America. But these days, the words United and Pennsylvania rarely occur in the same breath. Climate change is definitely up there for me. Um, reproductive rights, I think, is huge. Our country 
needs that call back to our faith. The contest here between Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman and Dr. Mehmet Oz could very well determine control of the U.S. Senate. But in York Central Market, what's top of mind is commerce. What kind of soup do you have? On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, dozens of small businesses run side by side. You get every walk of life in this market. Suzanne Rendy is an artist. What is it like for you to interact with all these different folks? I love it. Because you can never, it is so true, you can't judge a book by its cover. Ryan Robeson, a firefighter. His side hustle, a stand, not far away. A lot of these products come from York or Lancaster County. He says COVID hit the market with a wallop. We're still slowly getting those customers back as they feel more comfortable, but it has been a struggle. For the most part, customers and vendors at the market check their politics at the door. I have at Central Market politely told people that I didn't agree with what they said. It's a delicate balance. What we stand for often defines who we are. So we asked, not about the candidates whose names are on signs across the state, but the issues about which they care most deeply, enough to write on a sign of their own. So what color do you want? I'd like green. For the more liberal artist, Four. Suzanne Rendy. If you were going to have a yard sign, what would you put on your yard sign? Integrity. I think integrity will touch on every issue. Um, and I think that's what we need to see more of. <laughs> At home with Ryan Robes. Would you describe yourself as a conservative? I, I would describe myself as Catholic. What are you going to put on your sign? We're going to put choose life. We vote primarily pro-life. Um, that, in, in our opinion, we believe that that is the biggest issue that we face today as a nation. <laughs> At the market, though, politics does not collide with common purpose, says Russellina Nolden. Does it matter to you that there are people around here whose politics are completely different than yours? No. no. That doesn't sell my treats. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sell my treats. So I figured to each his own. We're all right. entitled to our own opinion. Yeah. But we're all old enough to treat each other with respect. United, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Harry Smith, NBC News, York, Pennsylvania. Love to know what you would write on that sign if Harry brought you one. Let us know. Still to come tonight, Donald Trump under oath. The former president sat for a deposition today in a defamation lawsuit. That's one of the legal headlines we'll break down next. Glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. The legal woes continue for former President Trump. Today he was questioned under oath in a defamation suit. Former magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll filed that lawsuit in 2019. She had previously accused Mr. Trump of raping her in a Manhattan department store back in the 90s. He has vehemently denied that that happened, saying, quote, I've never met this person in my life, unquote. New York Magazine published an excerpt of Ms. Carroll's account, and it included a picture of them together at a party in 1987. Trump has also said that Carol was not his type, and she claims that denial harmed her reputation. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now with more. Danny, what do we actually know about what happened today? Not a whole lot, and it's the wise choice of the attorneys on both sides to keep mum as much as they can about this deposition. But I bet when information leaks about the contents of this deposition, we're going to find that Trump probably didn't take the Fifth Amendment. He took a version of the Trump or maybe other defendants like Trump Fifth Amendment, which is the uh, sudden lack of memory. And he's just going to say, I don't remember, none of this ever happened. I flat out deny it. And you know why he can do that? Because it happened so long ago uh, that there really isn't a whole lot that they can use to corroborate. It's really going to be she said, he said, and he knows that. So he can roll into the deposition. He doesn't need to plead the Fifth like he did in an earlier deposition with the New York Attorney General case, he can just say, I don't remember any of it, I deny it, none of it's true. You talk about that. I mean, this is a rape allegation from decades ago. Is that part of why this has been in such legal limbo? Was it just a matter of the fact that he was the sitting president at the time that this was filed? Like, what are some of the factors bearing on the prospects for this lawsuit? A few years ago, the state of New York enacted the Child Victims Act, which has allowed uh, victims to bring lawsuits 
decades after they, the statute of limitations expired. This is a case that is in that same vein. And Carol's already indicated she's going to file when a new New York statute, which goes into effect November 24th, uh, gives people the chance to resurrect claims that are otherwise dead under the statute of limitations. But the challenge is, and I have some of these cases myself, uh, it's a good thing that the statute of limitations is extended, but no matter what, you still have to prove your case. And you run smack dab into the challenge of proving things that happened decades ago. That's hard under the, uh, under the clearest of circumstances with the most famous defendants. Uh, we're just getting a statement. Give me just a moment. There's a statement that came out uh -oh. from... His attorney, Alina Haba, very brief statement. It reads, quote, as we have said all along, my client was pleased to set the record straight today. This case is nothing more than a political ploy like many others in the long list of witch hunts against Donald Trump, unquote. Again, that's a statement from Alina Haba, who's an attorney for the former president. Uh, setting the record straight today, Danny, what about that? Talking about, that, that seems to kind of characterize, if, if I'm not reading too much into what she wrote, characterize that he actually answered questions about the deposition and said, this did not happen, that happened. That sounds like a very different strategy than just saying, I don't remember. Uh, yes. I mean, I expect, I fully expect he denies that any of this happened. I mean, certainly if he's asked, did you assault the plaintiff? He's not going to say, I don't remember. He's just going to say no. Uh, he's, if, yeah. As to other things, he's probably, probably used, I don't remember, many times or just flat out denied it. But this deposition was not like the deposition where he sat uh, in the civil case brought by the New York Attorney General. Those are questions that he has to be very careful about answering because they're about his personal finances. In that deposition, he did take the Fifth Amendment. I wouldn't be surprised if he took the Fifth Amendment zero times or maybe a smattering of times in today's deposition because he probably thinks he can get away with just saying, I don't remember, or this never happened, and I flat out deny it. Let me ask you about a few, well, one more thing about this, and then there are a few other legal matters I want to ask you about. The, the statement in terms of her not being his type, how does that play in terms of a defense? I think it would be one thing if we're talking about, I presume would be different, if we're talking about, say, a defendant who is gay and saying, she's not my type. That's one thing. Like, orientation can be a factor that bears on that, but just saying, I wasn't, into her, how does that even play in a rape case? That sounds like not the strongest defense. Well, Josh, I'll boil down what I think you're saying is, is it a defense in a rape or a civil equivalent case to say, I didn't think the victim was attractive? Well, in a civil case, that means that uh, you're going to have to test that theory against a jury, whether it be of six or 12, depending on your jurisdiction. And that's probably not going to fly, or maybe it will like an anvil. Uh, it won't necessarily work for the defendant. He can try it, and maybe it'll work with one or two of the jurors, but you're taking a real risk that you're going to inflame or really anger some of the jurors who are sitting on that jury or really anyone in the public who hears about the case. So not a legal defense to claim that the victim uh, was not your type or that you weren't attracted to her. Uh, and if Trump tries that and continues with that as his defense, he might run into some real problems with the jury if this ever gets to a jury. I don't want to make too many legal extrapolations about the array of legal matters in the former president's <laughs> orbit. But before I let you go, it's worth noting that there are still people who feel like they want to hear more from the former president about January 6th. There's a new poll out that reveals about two, about three fifths of Americans think that he should have to testify before the January 6th committee. That's according to a Monmouth poll. We know that the last order of business from the last January 6th House committee meeting was to approve a subpoena to have him testify. This is obviously not that, but the prospects for that, I think, seem remote, right? As remote as remote can be, I agree with you, Joshua. I don't think it's likely Trump is going to sit for a deposition or give an interview in the, before the January 6th committee. And, you know, the committee itself has, uh, has to shoulder some of the blame there because they waited until the last possible minute uh, because maybe they thought it was going to be some blockbuster announcement, or maybe they always knew that it would be a symbolic subpoena only, that the likelihood of them actually getting Trump uh, to come in was minimal. And it, it's a subpoena with an expiration date, which is in a couple months. And Trump and his legal team can delay things. I mean, they can, they can make the first hearing date delayed until the end of this 
uh, subpoena expiration date. And then from there, they could appeal right up and down the, uh, the court line uh, to the Supreme Court, appellate courts, anything to delay. And delay is a win when it comes to the subpoena. So I don't think anybody, including the committee, believes that Trump is going to actually sit down for sworn testimony or an unsworn interview. All right. Thank you, Danny. That's NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos with the latest on the various litigations around the former president. Tonight's headlines begin with the war in Ukraine. Today, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced martial law in four illegally annexed regions of Ukraine. This comes after a rare admission by a senior Russian general. The general described the situation in the city of Kherson as difficult and tense. Thousands of civilians have been evacuating the city. From our partners at Sky News, here's international affairs editor Dominic Waghorn. No Russian president has done this since World War II. We need to formalize this regime already within the framework of the Russian legislation. Therefore, I signed a decree on the introduction of martial law in these four entities of the Russian Federation. It will be immediately sent to the Federation Council for approval. Vladimir Putin's orders echoed by his puppet leaders in Ukraine, confirming martial law had been imposed. The move tightens Russia's grip in areas of Ukraine it's illegally annexed. Today it moved thousands more civilians in the south of occupied Ukraine. That followed this revealing admission from Putin's new commander about fresh military setbacks in the same region. Our further actions and plans regarding the city of Kherson itself will depend on the military tactic situation at hand. I will say this again, it is already very difficult as of today. Each time Putin's face setbacks, he's taken action to appear strong. Annexation and mobilization after retreats by Russian forces. A wave of drone attacks after a key bridge was sabotaged. And now martial law. But there's a danger in this for Putin. He's called this a special military operation in Ukraine. So the Russians feel it's remote and far away. But first with mobilization and now dusting down laws designed for use only in war, it's beginning to feel very different. What was sold as a limited operation is now feeling bigger than that. That could be a growing problem for Vladimir Putin. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News, Moscow. The biggest boy band in K-pop is breaking up temporarily. BTS is going on hiatus so that all its members can serve their mandatory military service in South Korea. Here's NBC's Aaron Gilchrist. South Korean boy band BTS is going from the big stage to the barracks. The K-pop group announcing on Monday that each member will serve in South Korea's military. Victor Cha is an NBC News contributor on Asian affairs. It's roughly the equivalent of when Elvis Presley uh, went into the military. Elvis Presley no longer has that rock and roll beat. The tempo is hut, two, three, four for Private Presley. And he chose at the height of his popularity uh, to serve in the military. South Korean law mandates that most able-bodied men perform at least 18 months of military service. Harry Song served in the Army from 2016 to 2018. He remembers his service as a time of personal growth. I was kind of forced in this environment where I was able to really make my own decisions and make my own calls and really think about what I wanted. Um, I stopped thinking too much about things and just really following what my heart was telling me. Not everyone has to serve, though. There have been exemptions in the past, about 500 of them granted by the Ministry of Culture for uh, pianists who won international competitions or soccer players or baseball players. While the government signs off, exemptions are not always welcomed by the public. There is a very deep strain of egalitarianism in Korean culture. Uh, everybody feels like we're all the, they're all the same. Even though BTS has gone on world tour, one place they likely won't be going in the military is to North Korea. Deterrence is held on the Korean Peninsula for the most part. So I don't really see a scenario in which they would then forced to, be forced to go to war. BTS's hiatus from the music world will take a toll on South Korea's economy. A study from the Hyundai Research Institute estimates BTS's contribution to the nation's gross domestic product at $3.6 billion a year. 
But for many Koreans, equal treatment is more important than lost revenue. BTS is regarded among Koreans as the personification and representation of Korea's global status. And so the notion that these individuals choose to enlist, I think, is a good sign. It's something that will be welcomed by the public. And if you're a BTS fan, you don't have to stress too much. The record label, Big Hit Music, says the band will reunite around 2025 after each member finishes his military service. Joshua, back to you. If you're not looking at the TV, look up for a second, because you should see these incredible new images that NASA released today. They come from the James Webb Space Telescope, giving a clearer view of a cloud of stars that we first saw back in the 90s. Look at this. This is called the Pillars of Creation. It's a region of newborn stars inside thick clouds of dust and gas. This is about 6,500 light years from Earth. If the picture looks familiar, take a look at the original. The Hubble Space Telescope first documented the Pillars of Creation in 1995. The picture on the left that you just saw was the updated one from 2014. And as you can see, this image is vastly sharper. One astrobiologist at the Planetary Science Institute called the image, quote, just spectacular beyond words and tweeted, oh, my universe. The $10 billion Webb Observatory launched into space last Christmas. Carl Sagan said we're made of star stuff. We have never looked better. What an amazing picture. Up next, a resignation over racism. The L.A. City Council's president stepped down over appalling comments on a leaked phone call. We'll break down what was said and who's under fire now. I stand with the people of Los Angeles and we cannot heal until Kevin De Leon and Gil Cedillo also resign from the city council. The Los Angeles City Council has a new president. He says he wants to restore trust in City Hall. That could be quite a task considering why the council has a new leader. Yesterday, members unanimously elected Paul Krikorian, the new council president. He replaces Nuri Martinez, who recently resigned. The reason? A recording of a private conversation with other council members from last year. The LA Times reported on that file last week, but it's unclear who made the recording. What is clear are the racist comments made by Ms. Martinez about another council member's black son, she describes the child as a changuito, Spanish slang for a little monkey. The conversation also included council members Kevin De Leon and Gil Cedillo, as well as labor leader Ron Herrera. Mr. Herrera also resigned, and President Biden has called for Councilman De Leon and Cedillo to step down too. Today, Mr. De Leon told LA's Univision station that he's sorry for the damage this has done, but he will not resign. The new council president is pushing for their resignations, but it appears the council cannot legally remove them. Some Angelinos are mixed on what to do now. I'm asking Kevin De Leon not to resign. Of course, it's up to him. But he has done a great job, and his real voters in his district respect him. We want the immediate resignations of Gil Cedillo and Kevin De Leon from city council. And there should be no business before this council until we have the resignation. Joining us now is Laura Cordy. She's been covering this story for Politico, where she co-authors the newsletter California Playbook. Ms. Cordy, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. We should note that those comments we just heard were from an L.A. City Council meeting that was held remotely because it's been so hard for the council to do business. People have been shutting down the meetings, protesters demanding these resignations. How is the city council coping with this right now? Yeah, like you said, the meetings have been held remotely. And the reason that they give for that is because one of the members, Mike Bonin, have a, had a COVID exposure. Um, but certainly protesters feel this is an attempt to silence the voice of the people. And the voice of the people is very angry. Um, in addition to the protests outside of City Hall, there have been campouts outside of members' houses. Um, even yesterday, we heard three hours of call-ins with just 
vitriol um, coming through the phone. People are really upset. They really want to see these members resign. And they're saying that council should not meet until they do resign. Um, and there's a lot of questions about whether that's the right thing to do. The new uh, council president, as you mentioned, Paul Krikorian, said that he's not going to stop uh, the lack of resignations from um, moving forward with the business of the city. Um, but I'm not sure if this uh, this anger is going away anytime soon. Protesters are, are really upset. They continue to rally. They continue to call for resignations. This whole thing kind of unearths or, or reveals, I think for some people who don't really know LA City Hall very well, a racial fault line that has been sitting under the city for generations and generations. I mean, I think it would mean one thing if you had a white council member referring to a black council member's son as a little monkey, but for a Latino council member to be referring to a white council member's black son as a little monkey, like the black Latino cultural line is not one that we talk about a whole lot in this country. We mostly think in terms of black and white. What is this saying about LA in terms of relationships between groups of color? Yeah, it's easy for folks to forget that this tension has been in Los Angeles for decades. It's bubbled over at times. We think of it normally during the Watts riots of the 60s and, of course, in the 90s um, with the beating of Rodney King. And people have done a lot of work in the decades since to bridge those divides, to unite Black and Latino Angelinos towards the same goals. And uh, we're hearing from, you know, a lot of Latinos after these recordings that they feel like this sets them back. Latinos have been fighting for representation. They are becoming um, more and more the most populous demographic in Los Angeles. And they feel like now this recording has undermined some of the trust that they've built with the Black community. And of course, the Black community in turn feels like they're not sure if they can trust Latino leaders. There's some definite wounds that need to be healed here. Um, but, uh, you know, I think on the bright side, we can say that there's a lot of people who are dedicated to healing those wounds and bridging those divides. But it was kind of a surprise for people who haven't followed Los Angeles for a long time that this dynamic exists. And it's definitely still very real and very painful. I know there's a lot to be done between here and whenever this is resolved. And there have been reasonable concerns among Latinos in Los Angeles that the city is so vastly Latino, but the city council representation has been so much lower than the population proportionally. So I understand that issue. At the same time, Mike Bonin has tweeted that this is kind of reflecting a number of policy issues that he says some of the members in question have, in his view, stonewalled that would be to the benefit of the city. That, of course, is debatable. Policy issues get very complicated and technical. I wonder where this goes from here. I mean, the, the idea that anyone would call anybody's child a little monkey, I mean, you say that about my kid, you better jump into the Pacific and swim like hell to Guam, because I'm coming. I don't even know how you work through the anger around just that piece of it, let alone get anything done at City Hall. What's the next move? Yeah, I mean, I, we should note that the person who made that uh, offensive remark um, you know, did step down almost immediately or within a few days, that was Nuri Martinez. But uh, still people are saying the fact that Gil Cedillo and Kevin De Leon even tolerated that, didn't essentially stand up and intervene, is enough for them to leave the council. Um, you know, people are saying that it's going to be impossible for the council to gain the trust of Angelinos to continue with any business. Um, but, you know, Los Angeles is a huge city. There's four million people. There's a huge budget. There are ongoing crises happening. Homelessness continues to be a big problem. I mean, people need their city leaders. And right now, um, you know, the idea of stopping that momentum, I think some people say just it can't be done. But, um, you know, even as De Leon said today, it's going to require a lot of healing. It's going to require a lot of building bridges, a lot of difficult conversations. And um, I mean, now yeah. that De Leon's not stepping down, it's, it might be tougher. And just in our last 10 seconds, very briefly, we still don't know who made that recording or where it came from, right? That's correct. We have no idea. It showed up on Reddit anonymously, and that's all we know. Laura Cordy of Politico's California Playbook, thanks for talking this through with us tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Will this winter bring a surge of COVID cases? We'll hear what the CEO of Pfizer had to say to NBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin before we go. 
If you're due for a COVID vaccine booster, now you have another option. Today, the FDA and the CDC each okayed a third dose of the Novavax vaccine for adults. And that includes for people who started with a Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson shot. Health officials are urging us all to get boosted in case of a COVID surge this winter. Pfizer CEO Albert Borla says he expects this winter to be rough. A surge in Europe could mean trouble for the U.S. If we won't pick up between now and the next five weeks in vaccinations rates in the U.S. Uh, so that people will be immune, uh, I think it will be a tough win. Albert Borla gave an in-depth interview to Andrew Ross Sorkin for a new series. Special edition with Andrew Ross Sorkin debuts tonight on NBC News Now. Andrew Ross Sorkin joins us now. Andrew, congratulations on the new show. We love us an interview here on Now Tonight, so I'm glad to see more people doing extended interviews on our air. Tell us more about it. What's the goal, and what kind of people will you be talking to? Well, thank you, and it's nice to be joining you, by the way, and I'm a big fan of yours, so this is very exciting um, selfishly. You know, well, we're trying to put together a, a place, a program where you can really see long-form, nuanced conversations uh, where you really get to go deep. And, and all too often, as we know, we're in this, you know, moment-by-moment -moment world where everything's chopped up, and this is an opportunity to really sit with some of the most consequential people of this moment, whether they be in business and politics politics and culture and really try to go deep. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what this first interview is an attempt to do. Do you think you'll be focusing on some of the kinds of conversations that you have? Because we obviously see you every morning on Squawk Box on CNBC. Will they be kind of in line with those sorts of conversations? More like business leaders, thought leaders, influencers, well, honestly, movers and shakers, or a variety of people? Okay. I think it's actually going to be so. very different. I think you're, you know, we, we started with a business leader uh, in this instance, but it was really because Albert Burla, who's the CEO of Pfizer, has become such a flashpoint uh, for this issue that we're all dealing with around the world, which is COVID and vaccines. And the conversation really wasn't about the business of Pfizer or even the business of vaccines. It was about mandates. It was about free speech. It was about whether, uh, you know, you should be able to say what you want on social media and be skeptical or not. Of, of vaccination, about how to deal with Paxlovid, about the future research, all of that. And so that's really the goal. And I think those are the kind of conversations uh, that we're going to try to have on this program. And again, it's, it's not a business show. It's actually very, very far from a business show. It's really more of a discussion with people in the moment uh, that we're all grappling with and trying to get our heads around often complicated issues. What was your sense of how he and perhaps other pharmaceutical you know, C-level leaders are dealing with all those politics? I mean, I, I think that folks like Albert Borla would rather just talk to the public when they've got quarterly earnings statements or positive announcements or good things to say about the company and not have to get anywhere near some of the politics that COVID has kind of dragged the pharmaceutical industry into. Well, the truth is I actually think that most business leaders today think they're in the business of politics and policy more often than, you, than not. And actually, the folks that might have been considered in politics or policy think in many instances, given the money involved, they're in business. Um, I think when you look at an Albert Burla or any of these uh, C-level executives, they're dealing and grappling with all sorts of really uh, large social issues, whether it be voting rights, um, whether it be uh, race relations, I mean, all sorts of things that, that historically actually companies have tried not to touch. Well, it's not only that they're not trying not to touch them. In many cases, they're being forced uh, forced or, or, or otherwise to lean into these issues because either their employees are calling, them for, uh, calling for them to do it or consumers are calling that for them to do it. I hear you on that in terms of the way that kind of the relationship between industry and the public has shifted where, you know, depending on the issue, some consumers will insist that companies have a point of view on it or they're not sure if they want to do business anymore. And by the way, there's a in backlash light of that, too. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to say, yeah, and there's that a is another possible kind of backlash, that, which yeah. is to say, exactly. 
Well, then how does he feel about things like, say, vaccination rates? I mean, considering that that is still, you know, lagging behind what I think a lot of public health officials would like to see, especially with concerns about a possible winter surge, did he have thoughts in terms of how well or poorly we've done with trying to get people vaccinated and what we do now? Oh, I think he is greatly... Um greatly disappointed with, with the rate of vaccination. Uh, right now, at least as of last week, it was about 13 to 15 million Americans uh, that had gotten this late, latest biovalent booster. To put that in context, there was a point of time early on when people were getting, 4 million people, uh, Americans were getting the vaccine a day. So we have a lot of work to do. And if you do believe that history is a guide and uh, where Europe is in terms of uh, this, 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 new, uh, this new wave of COVID, that we are three, four, five weeks behind. That puts us, you know, somewhere around Thanksgiving. And I think he's very, very worried about it. But at the same time, it's very interesting because he was somebody who did think that mandates were a good thing. And he was somebody who did think that social media really needed to uh, prevent, frankly, uh, skeptics and others who were putting out what he called misinformation uh, out there. Today, I think he recognizes that that approach might have actually been uh, the wrong one that there was a backlash. We all saw the backlash, and I think we're living with that backlash today because it's not just an issue, by the way, of people not getting the latest booster for COVID. It's actually a backlash against vaccines more broadly, and I think that's something that deeply concerns him. One more cut from your interview with him I'd like to play. You asked him about the potential for these mRNA vaccines, like the ones we got for COVID, to be used to fight other diseases. Here's part of what he said. Watch. Yep. I think we are just scratching the surface of uh, the technology. Uh, the first uh, wave, I think, will be more vaccines. Right now, we only have COVID vaccines. I think, uh, hopefully, if science proves itself, we will see flu vaccines, we will see zoster vaccines, we will see multiple other vaccines with this technology that will get better results than the current uh, vaccinations. The second wave, I think, uh, likely will come in oncology. Oncology. Oncology in cancer. So before I let you go, it sounds like he sees a lot of potential for different kinds of medical advances from this sort of technology. Oh, I think there's no question that mRNA technology has all sorts of uh, real opportunities, especially when you start to think about cancer. Uh, however, I, and again, it goes back to this issue of skepticism that we have with the current vaccination and the vaccine itself, which is there are people who are scared of, of mRNA technology. So I think there's going to be a, a period of time where, where Americans and, and really the globe are going to uh, really try to be, need to probably better understand the science. And frankly, uh, the world of scientists and experts are probably going to have to do a better job of of explaining it all and persuading people, in some cases perhaps rather than forcing them, uh, to start to better understand what this what this science uh, really can, can bring. Of course, there's always going to be also debates about the cost of all of this. Andrew Ross Sorkin, the new series is called Special Edition. It debuts tonight at 1030 Eastern here on NBC News Now. And you can also watch anytime on Peacock, YouTube, and at NBCNews.com. Glad to see another foot soldier in the long-form interview army here on NBC News Now. Congratulations on the I'm new show. And thanks for making time for my us. friend. Oh, thanks. God. Well, yeah, I mean, we do eight-minute interviews, and you're like, I'll see your eight, and we'll give you 30. So I'm, I'm glad the competition is on. But looking forward to the new show. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you so much for making time for us, and we will see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.